Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? My name is Jack Newley. I am the interim assistant to the director at the Blasey Center uh, down at Boston College, uh, one of the co-hosts for tonight's event. I just wanted to briefly introduce the Blasey Center for those of you who may not be familiar, um, give some background, um, and then I'll hand it off to Dennis Hollinger, who will introduce our panelists, and we'll get rolling. So um, for the past 20 years, the Blasey Center for Religion and American Public Life has hosted conversations and scholarly reflections around inter issues at the intersection of religion and American public life. Our goal is to engage various audiences, both scholarly and public, um, through conferences, screenings, symposia, and colloquia, among others. Our events feature scholars and public figures from all over the world, including recent events with Professor Elizabeth Johnson from Fordham University, who delivered our 18th annual Prophetic Voices Lecture entitled The Challenge of Us in Ecological Times, um, and screenings, um, including one uh, back in January by documentarian Martin Dobelmeyer, entitled Backs Against the Wall, the Howard Thurman story, which was a discussion of the life and ministry of Howard Thurman, a famed civil rights leader, mystic, and theologian. Um, so if any of these things interest you, I encourage you to please check out our website, which is bc.edu slash boisi, B-O-I-S-I. Um, and you can also sign up for our mailing list there. So thanks so much. And without further ado, Dennis Hollinger. Well, thank you, and good to see all of you. Thank you for coming out tonight. It really is uh, a great delight to be able to work with the Boise Center in co-hosting this tonight. I have been uh, on the board of advisors at the center. It's a center on religion and public life, as was just mentioned, for the past, I guess, two years, is it? And uh, uh, Mark Mesa, who is the director, was a uh, former dean at the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. That's where we first met. And uh, the center has been a, a very significant player in helping people think about the intersection of religion and public life. Frank Wolf was the former director, had written very uh, broadly, and uh, it was a great honor when Mark was selected to be director of the center. Uh, he thought they needed uh, a representative from the evangelical world on that center, and so uh, invited me to be part of the advisory board, and I'm delighted to uh, have done so. Tonight is uh, a really special evening in so many ways uh, for Marianne and me because it's reconnecting also with two old friends, Randy Balmer from our seminary days. Uh, Randy uh, was at Columbia University, Barnard College at Columbia for many years in the history department. And now in the last, is it seven years, Randy, at Dartmouth College. He has written uh, very broadly on religion and American life, including evangelicalism, has ventured into the world of film as well and done some outstanding documentaries. He and his son are actually planning on doing a film on the Orthodox in Alaska. Very, very interesting theme. And uh, we'll await that uh, production, Randy, when that comes out. And then John Fia from Messiah College, historian there, uh, we played basketball together for several years at noontime basketball at Messiah College uh, when I was vice provost there. And uh, that's where we got to know each other and have always appreciated discussions with him. So around the table tonight, we had a wonderful discussion about uh, history and about evangelicalism and all kinds of things and a wonder wonderful dinner prepared by Marianne. Thank you for that dinner, Marianne. And uh, I think we're in for a real treat tonight. So glad that you all came. We hope that you'll stay afterwards from, for some refreshments and uh, a time to talk to the panelists and a time to meet others. So without further ado, Dr. Mark Mesa. Thank you. Do you need this one or? I'll take that one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. The uh, drill, or as we Catholics say, the ritual program will be, uh, for the next 30 minutes, we'll have a conversation among the three of us, and then we'll open up to all of you by 8.15. Um, hopefully you'll be on your way enlightened, uh, and hopefully the rain will stop by then. So we'll start with the conversation between John and Randy here. So I guess my, I have five questions for them. The first question is, how has the evangelical involvement in US politics changed <laughs> since the presidency of Ronald Reagan, or do you think it has changed? 
And if so, in what ways has it changed? So either one. Uh, I'm going to take it back a whole lot farther than that, if I may, quickly. Uh, I'm a historian, so as, as, as John is as well, uh, and, and so is Mark. Uh, I'd want to go back to uh, the 19th century and talk about evangelicalism really setting the social and political agenda for much of the nation in the 19th century. In, particularly in the antebellum period, coming out of the Second Great Awakening, flush with optimism about the perfectibility of society, evangelicals were very much involved in issues of social concern. Uh, they were involved in various peace crusades. They were involved in the origins of public educations, which was called at that time common schools because they saw this as a way of bringing those on the lower rungs of society up into the ranks of the middle class. They were involved in, uh, in, in the abolition of slavery, obviously in the North. You do have evangelicals in the South defending slavery, and I'm not going to try to paper over that. But in the North, uh, evangelicals were involved in, in abolitionism. Evangelicals were also involved, of course, in the temperance movement. They were involved in women's rights, including voting rights, which was a radical idea in the 19th century. So what happens? Uh, around the turn of the 20th century, evangelicals begin to shift a little bit toward workers' rights and understanding the, uh, the importance of workers being able to organize against predatory capitalists. And then, this is a very quick skip through the decades here, and then uh, what happens is really the Scopes trial of 1925. And evangelicals after that begin to uh, uh, retreat from the larger society and begin to construct in earnest what I call the evangelical subculture, which was this vast interlocking network of seminaries, Bible colleges, Bible institutes, Bible camps, publishing houses, missionary societies, uh, churches and denominations, of course, that were really set up as a defensive measure against what was, was considered the both corrupt and corrupting influence of the larger world of the large, and, and the larger culture. And evangelicals really remained pretty much cosseted in that subculture for half a century, roughly from, these are somewhat arbitrary uh, um, bookends, but it, it works. The Scopes trial in 1925 and uh, Jimmy Carter's campaign for the presidency in 1975. And Carter begins to bring evangelicals out, back into the political arena, not really in an organized way, but uh, I think for many evangelicals, simply for the novelty of being able to vote for one of their own, someone who is uh, like them, a born again evangelical Christian. And that begins to change uh, four years later, and, and Carter's presidency is so crucial because that's when you begin to see the rise of the religious right and uh, the movement of evangelicals into politics in an organized way under Jerry Falwell and particularly Paul Weyrich, who's really pulling the strings behind the movement. And I just want to make uh, one quick point here. And that is to say that uh, the, the, the common understanding is that it was the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973 that brought uh, evangelicals into the political realm. And uh, I call this the abortion myth because it uh, collapses on historical uh, examination. Uh, what brought evangelicals into the political realm, particularly people like Jerry Falwell, was instead the defense of tax-exempt status for racially segregated institutions. Bob Jones University was the most prominent, but others as well. And that is what gets evangelicals uh, motivated or mobilized politically in the late 1970s, turning against Jimmy Carter, one of their own, in favor of Ronald Reagan in 1980. So I'll, I'll, I've gone on far too long. I'll, I'll leave it there. And Please see volume one of Randy Balmer's response to Mark Madison. Sorry. That was excellent. Thank you. John? No, I, I would affirm everything that Randy said. Um, I'm not uh, certainly progressive, the progressive dimensions of 19th century evangelicalism, the concern with social justice, uh, the concern with all of these reform movements. Um, you know, at the same time, the 19th, you know, white evangelicals in the 19th century are also uh, at the forefront of things like nativism, trying to keep Catholics out of the country, uh, slavery, which you mentioned. 
Um, you know, I love the story of the election of 1800 when Thomas Jefferson gets elected and uh, all these New England Federalists are afraid that he's going to come into their house and steal their Bibles and close down their churches, right? So I see, I see uh, it as sort of a complex story, um, but there's continuity and change over time, I think. The continuity is, especially as we think about evangelicals in the election of 2016, is um, one, of, one of fear in some ways. And, and there's always been that fear that the evangelical nation, the Christian nation that evangelicals are trying to create, whether it be, uh, and in, in some ways in the 19th century, it was very much uh, a Christian kind of, you know, post-millennial, let's bring in the, the, the usher in the kingdom of God, um, caused them to respond. Lyman Beecher, one of the great social reformers of the early 19th century, will also, you know, Wrote, a, wrote an essay called A Plea for the West, uh, in which he didn't want Catholics coming in. So, so I, do, I do agree with Randy about the 70s and 80s, there being a total sea change, though. And actually, much of what I know about that, I've learned uh, from Randy's work. Um, I've tend to, I've, this is not a point of disagreement. I've just tended to see it as a much more, um, uh, a much more macro kind of, you know, bigger, longer uh, period of time where, anxiety about prayer in public schools, Bible reading in public schools, desegregation of Christian academies, abortion. Um, I would say even the Immigration Act of 1965, uh, which brings in all kinds of non-Western um, uh, people, religious people into the country. Um, all of those things create a perfect storm, I think, that provides the larger context for you know, the, the, the segregation issues or, or even uh, the abortion myth. Right. Um, so if you take a longer view, there's, there's other things that they're concerned about as well. But I don't disagree with anything that Randy said about the importance of. But I think what Randy's work has done is it has brought this, this issue of um, this Green v. Connolly segregation issue into the, into the scholarship as, a, as, a, as an important thing to consider that we hadn't thought about, that, thought about before. Non-evangelical scholars, that is, people who publish in works like First Things, which is largely a Catholic thing, or commentary. We all know the old Woody Allen joke, that commentary and dissent merged to become dysentery. But they, they, they I point... I heard that one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> their, their theory is that, that the fundamentalist controversy that basically goes from 1920 to the 19, through 1950, let's say, that, that that really shaded the emergence of what we now call neo-evangelicalism. So that the newer brand of evangelical, evangelicalism that emerged with Carter and Reagan was more pessimistic and more kind of suspicious of the mainstream culture. Do you think that's fair, or do you think because it's written by non-evangelicals, they miss what's going on there? <laughs> well, I mean, there's no question that there, there's a lot of suspicion of, of the main, mainline culture, mainstream culture, that's, that's you know, the, kind of the... the, the uh, I want to say fundamental rhetoric of the of the fundamentalists. Uh, there's no question that the, that uh, that is there. But I, you know, I'm getting back to the to the real catalyst, and and I don't, I'm I'm, I'm with John on on the larger uh, uh, picture. But in getting back to the real catalyst, uh, it, it, it you know it was this particular issue. Do you want to address that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the kind of you know, the conservative evangelicals that embrace what today is known as the Christian right or the moral majority or the religion, you know, a lot of these came out, they didn't come out of the neo-evangelical movement. Uh, people like Jerry Falwell came out of a separatist, Baptist, fundamentalist movement. You know, I mean, that was that, that you know, you don't get engaged. I mean, you, you read what Bob Jones would say about Jerry Falwell when he formed the moral majority. Uh, Bob Jones said, this is heresy that you're getting involved in politics and not going around preaching the gospel. So, uh, you know, it, 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 gets com it gets complicated. It's hard to draw, I think, a direct line between, like, uh, uh, Carl Henry and Billy Graham and Fuller Seminary and Jerry Falwell Sr. Um, because Falwell comes out of a very different kind of subculture that the neo-evangelicals, I think, were reacting against. And, and much more rooted in the, in the fundamentalist modern. And, and Falwell was pretty insistent from, through most of his career. He didn't want to be known as an evangelical. Exactly. He wanted to be a, yeah. uh, yeah. known as a fundamentalist. I must say, it, it, it gives, us, uh, gives Catholics a uh, great peace of mind to know that there's a religious group as internally divided and as vociferous against each other as the Catholics are. So <laughs> thank you. I want to personally thank you for that. So it's like, do you think that evangelicals 
have a distinctive political style when they engage in the public realm. Do you think that's true, or do you think that's just sort of a, a false sense? And if you think they do have a distinctive style, what is that style? Well, I think, I think evangelicals, this is what I argued in my book on, on Donald Trump. I mean, evangelicals, evangelicals' engagement with public life, I think, are really, is really driven by three things. Uh, fear, which I've already mentioned. Uh, fear of demographic, social, and cultural changes in society. You see this all through American history. I trace this all the way back to Salem. Right? I mean, if, if you want to really take the long view. Um, but also, it, I think since the 70s, as they begin to lose cultural control, as evangelicals you know, begin to lose whatever cultural power they had in society, uh, you begin to see them pursuing uh, electoral politics uh, in a way that they perhaps hadn't in an extensive way before that. And then I think there's always this nostalgia, nostalgia when you're associated, you know, we need to get back, you know, listen to GOP, especially the religious right GOP candidates, right? Renew, restore, reclaim, right? We, we want to get back to something that I would argue probably didn't even exist in the first place, right? But so, so I think it's these kinds, of, these kinds of looking backward kind of approaches, always trying to reclaim something and using political power to do that. Um, now again, I don't think what evangelicals do when they engage public life, at least those on the conservatives, is, is anything different than what a lot of uh, secular people or mainline Protestants do uh, or, or other groups do. But I guess I'm so hard on them for this because there's something about the pursuit of power, the giving into fear uh, that is deeply unbiblical, <laughs> unchristian, right? So, you know, I expect, I expect, uh, you know, those on the secular left or progressives on the left, you know, secularists to, to be fearful of Donald Trump and what he's going to do to the republic or, or be nostalgic for some, you know, golden age of the 60s or, uh, you know, pursue power, right? But I don't think that's the way of the cross or the way of Jesus to pursue politics that way. So, uh, so yeah, that's... That's, I think, what they're driven by, these three things, or at least, I think we saw that very clearly in the election of 2016. Yeah, so you, so, second. So, so you would say there, you would make a distinction between styles of evangelical politics, between well, I mean, the new religious right and the neo-evangelical. Well, we were talking about this at dinner. I mean, there's, you know, when I see 81% of white evangelicals voting for a particular candidate, it seems to me they're operating under a particular playbook or approach to political life, uh, you know, that's related to winning power, change the world through power, change the world through government, uh, you know, getting, getting the levers of government. Um, so, so uh, I, yeah, I think, uh, I think this is, this is a, pers tell me your question again, you were. No, so would you make a distinction within Yeah, so I think there's, yeah, so 81%, there are others who, you know, would reject that. So I dedicated my book to the 19%. Right? I mean, I think there are, you know, a bunch of evangelicals out there, certainly not in the majority, though, who would reject these kind of ideals. And, you know, we could debate whether or not we want to call them more consistently evangelical. Or, you know, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. We, could, we have a plebiscite at the end of this, so we'll vote. Yeah. Okay. Can I get, get, a, get a whack at that question? This, the question about a, a, a specific style uh, that evangelicals employ in the political arena. Uh, if, if I had to pick one, I think it is the rhetoric of victimization. And uh, if, if you, you look back through uh, Falwell's sermons and, and, his, uh, uh, and his television program, or Pat Robertson, it's, it's always this victimization, which is driving this thing for you know, the so-called religious freedom push, right? Because the, the, we're, we're being victimized. We're, we're the ones who are, 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 are marginal in the, in the society. When, of course, you look at the numbers, you, numbers tell you a very different story. And I think, you know, to kind of to circle back to the 2016, I think my own formulation, why that 81%, I think there's three reasons. I think one had to do with the uh, long-time, persistent, frequently reinforced demonization of the Democratic nominee among evangelicals. And even talking to my family members, I, the answer that comes most often is, I couldn't imagine myself pulling a lever for Hillary Clinton. I think the second issue is that Donald Trump is very, very good at this rhetoric of victimization. Now, it's all about him, of course. 
But they, evangelicals recognized that, and they un understood that language and that vocabulary because they identified with it themselves. And I think the third reason is um, I, I think that uh, the 2016 election allowed evangelicals finally to, uh, to uh, dispense with the fiction that this was a movement about family values. And, do, you, do you think that the 81% was a foregone conclusion, or was there a debate within the evangelical community about Donald Trump? I think Trump? there was a debate, uh, certainly. I mean, they certainly uh, had looked at other candidates before they settled on Trump, but when Trump emerged as the nominee, uh, they, you know, they, went, they went along with it. But, you know, again, to put it in historical perspective, at a much greater percentage or significantly greater percentage than any other uh, presidential. 81% draw my attention. You had me at 81%, as we yeah. said. That's, yeah. a, that's a big number. Right. So who do evangelicals involved in the political sphere see as their allies, and who do they see as their biggest competitors or foes or adversaries or use whatever biblical yeah. metaphor you want there? Yeah. Well, I think if you listen to if you listen to evangelicals, especially those who have supported our current president, um, you know you you hear these phrases, right? Uh, uh, the secular left, progressivism, um, even mainline Protestants. You know, I think anyone who does not uh, embrace the kind of social issues, whether it be marriage, abortion, or now the the new hot one, right? You know, evangelicals have kind of lost, conservative evangelicals have kind of lost the fight on, on marriage, right? So since Obergefell in 2015, they've suddenly switched strategies uh, to now talk about religious liberty, right? And, and the right that they have to, to uphold their traditions views on marriage. I think as an evangelical myself, I mean, I think there's some, some legitimacy uh, to that critique. But um, anyone, that they can, anyone that they can demonize, of course, uh, on these social issues. And the thing about evangelicals is that they tend to, uh, many conservative evangelicals uh, who are involved in politics, and again, we're talking here about the members of the Christian right uh, who rally behind Donald Trump. I think one of the things that these evangelicals do is they tend to demonize their opponents, right? I mean, if you are pro-life, right, on abortion, calling Democrats or progressives baby killers, right, is not something that, that helps to advance a pluralistic society, right? You may actually believe that the taking of a baby in the womb is a form of murder, right? But you're using this kind of language in the public sphere is only kind of exacerbating uh, these, kinds of, these kinds of tensions. So it's not, a, it's not just who these evangelicals are opposed to, but then how they decide to demonize them uh, in such a way. And I see it every day on my Twitter feed, on my social media feeds, on the emails that I've received since I've written this book on Donald Trump. Um, there's no middle ground. And that gets to this kind of Manichaean kind of idea, this black and white kind of idea. Uh, it's where, an old idea. Yeah, it's been around I mean, where, for a while. where you can't, you, you know, evangelicals do not want to work towards a kind of pluralist, I, I would argue that evangelicals need to work towards a more pluralistic society. Um, I would defend the evangelicals' religious liberty to uphold traditional views on marriage, say, in their own institutions. Um, I think this is going to be a serious issue for Christian colleges down the road, right? How they're going to, and, and, you know, the college, the CCCU, where my school's a part of, is already trying to come up with creative ways to address this. But Certainly, I think what evangelicals need to work harder at is learning how to live with people who have fundamental disagreements on these issues. And I would turn the tables on, on the sort of secular left, right? I think they also need to learn that we live in a pluralistic society as well. I love John Anazu on this, you know, confident pluralism and, and the sort of vision that he's set out. So that's my take, yeah. Nothing to say. This is the first. I am astonished. No, <laughs> this is the first time I've ever asked Randy Balmer a question, and he has no answer. I, well, no, ask me, ask me the question again. What, what? So, so who do evangelicals see as their primary allies and or adversaries in the political sphere? Oh, I see, I see. Well, I mean, I think, you know, again, going back historically, what, uh, the importance of the 1980 election, I think, was is that you had this alignment, a, a kind of uh, uh, rock-solid alignment between uh, white conservative evangelical voters and the Republican Party that has merely uh, congealed over the su succeeding de decades. And 
anyone who's not part of that. I mean, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, I'm sure that, that John has heard it as well. Now, people say, well, how can you be a, a, a Christian and, and a Democrat at the same time, you know, as if there were some, something fundamentally uh, uh, mutually exclusive uh, about the two. And, and it's, it's and, I, and I think that that sort of uh, kind of unflinching identification is what fed into the, the 2016 uh, presidential election. According to the Pew, I'm, a, I'm an inveterate reader of the Pew yeah, Trust, sure. as I know yeah. you are too. Uh, according to the last Pew Trust religious uh, sampling, the largest single group are evangelical Christians, which which is still the largest, but losing some traction, yeah. according to the Pew Trust. I think there's it's, a generational element yeah. there. Yeah. Secondly, Catholics in the third largest religious groups are former Catholics, which is <laughs> alarming if you're a Roman Catholic like I am. Yeah. So there are 11 million former Catholics yeah. who yeah. defect in place. They don't join another church. They simply cease uh, yeah. doing any kind of formal religious exercise. But I'm, a, I'm also reading, I read both the New York Times and the New Testament, I always say. And according to the New York Times, um, there seems to be a, um, a division within the evangelical ranks between white evangelicals and evangelicals of color. Yeah. And there seems to be some question about, among evangelicals of color who belong to interracial congregations, about whether they feel at home there or whether that the evangelical community they belong to locally no longer reflects their own concerns and persona. Do you think that's, do you th now, I'm a critical reader of the New York Times, okay, so, yeah. uh, uh, so the New York Times doesn't always get it right, but do you think the Times is right? Uh, I, th I think there's something to that, and I'm gonna broaden that uh, in, in deference to a, a comment that was made to me uh, before tonight's uh, meeting. What's, uh, I, I'm not by any means an expert on evangelicalism globally, but, what a little I know, what strikes me is that evangelicalism everywhere outside of North America tends to list a left to the left of the political spectrum. In North America, of course, it's not. It's the other, other direction. I'm fascinated by this. I'm not exactly sure why, but even if you look at uh, Harvey Cox's book about Pentecostalism in Latin America, uh, and I have other friends who've been down there as well who talk about uh, Pentecostalism or evangelicalism more generally being the new theology of the people. I'm sorry about that, Mark, but... You know, That's right. <laughs> uh, I'll quote you on it. In, in, in Latin America. And it, very clearly, this is, you know, if you're talking about a political spectrum, we're talking about at least leaning toward the left everywhere outside of North America. And why do you think that is? Well, I, don't, I, I would only be speculating because I'm, I'm not an expert in Oh, speculate. speculate. You're, uh, you're, well, you're I, better at speculating well, than you know, I am. But, you know, again, it has to do with, with uh, this notion of being a theology of the people. That is, evangelicalism in these other places, it seems to me, is uh, uh, much more aligned in the direction of 19th century evangelicalism. Uh, taking concern for those that Jesus called the least of these, those on the margins of society. And to talk about Pentecostalism, or evangelicalism being the new theology of the people in Latin America, that's exactly the orientation of that, uh, of that tradition. Now, again, I'm, I'm not an expert, but that would be my, my uh, hypothesis. I think, I think, the, I think the, it's a different, when you talk about them being on the left of the political spectrum, I think it's a different political spectrum. So certainly they are embracing all these social justice yeah. positions that you're talking about. But I mean, all you have to do is look at places like Brazil and these, you know, where, where you have staunch sort of pro-life, almost like a Christian right kind of, pro-life and marriage are also incredibly important on that side of the, the ledger too for, for non-Western. But what was the original? So my question is, 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 is are the, are evangelicals divided by race or class? Yeah, I mean, you know, the question about the interracial churches, I mean, I, you know, I, I think, I think if, if there are African Americans who are worshiping at a predominantly, you know, a white evangelical church, I would, ima I would, I would think that the, the pastor or the leadership of that church is trying to do the hard work of trying to race, bring racial reconciliation uh, to, that, 
to that community. Um, but certainly, you know, I always get asked this by people who uh, are, are on the hard right, you know, and are conservative evangelicals. They say, why do you always talk about white evangelicals, right? As if I'm engaging in some kind of sinister kind of identity politics or, you know, evangelicalism is sort of, you know, there is no race, color, creed, right? You know, Jesus died for all kind of thing. And that's, I don't disagree with that idea. But you know, I'm, I'm responding to the, the polls, the surveys, right? Clearly, white evangelicals were attracted to people like Donald Trump and have always been attracted to the agenda of, of the Christian right more than uh, people of, of color. And you know, if you read the sociologist Robert Jones's book on the death of white Christian America, the future of even the church in America is, is people of color. Um, you know, which gets into these really, to me, very strange kind of situations on the border, right? Where you have most of these, most of these immigrants are Christians of one form or another, right? But, but, you know, rather than seeking out sort of spiritual fellowship in some way with fellow believers, uh, American evangelicals have so kind of uh, attached themselves to this kind of nationalism, closed borders America first, which is, a, I think, a problem uh, it's not only a, a, a historical problem, it's also a theological problem um, that, that you know, they, they prefer either race or nationalism or something over, you know, over their commitment to these, uh, to these immigrants. So you'd say that, that if, you, if you had a crystal ball, if you had an evangelical crystal ball, which I realize is maybe an oxymoron. I'm a historian, um, remember, okay, right? I don't, yeah, I don't predict. All historians have crystal balls. <laughs> and so are you. Um, uh, so it seems to me, you, what I hear you saying, and you can correct me, is that even evangelicals are divided to some extent, or at least local communities are divided by race, and they're also divided between the North Atlantic world and the South Atlantic world. That evangelicalism in the South Atlantic world in Latin America and in Africa looks different in terms of its ideology. I'm sorry? And in Europe too, okay. We have a question coming our way, that's good. So it's like a... <laughs> That's good. Questions are good. Uh, what else do you think are the big questions that the evangelicalism is going to have to face? So you don't have the women problem that the Catholics have no. in terms of having women can't be clergy. I mean, that's one thing. But, but what are the big things that you think that marriage is going to be a big I think, issue? I think marriage is the huge issue for, um, for especially evangelical kind of institutions. Um, you know, every Christian college I know uh, is, is getting their ducks in order on this question, right? You know, to show that they've had long-held beliefs on this, so when, when you know, things come down. Uh, the CCCU has a really interesting proposal out right now. It goes by, a, there's a name. It's, it, it's with the National Association of Evangelicals, too, and I can't remember the name they use. But they're trying to negotiate uh, with Congress so that, um, how does it work? So that uh, gay, uh, uh, people of LGBT community have are protected. Their rights are protected uh, through a, through legislation, um, and part of the package would also be Christian colleges have the right to uphold their views on marriage as part. Of, do you remember Dennis? What that? The fairness for all clause, right? So I think evangelicals are going to have to be creative uh, if they want to uphold these you know traditional what they believe to be biblical. Um, you know, commitments to marriage. And so, so I think that's going to be another big test, but also dealing with the, you know, the diversity of evangelical. You know, how are these largely white evangelicals going to deal with uh, increasing diversity within their churches and within their communities? I think the big crisis facing evangelicalism is uh, recovering their moral compass. Um, I've been saying this for years. <laughs> my sense of American religious history, at least, is that religion functions best at the margins of society and not in the councils of power. Once you begin to hanker after political influence and power, you lose your prophetic voice. And I think that is a synopsis of what has happened to evangelicalism over the past half century. Uh, there's been such a hankering after political power and influence and access to the Oval Office and all this stuff that in the process evangelicalism has lost its soul. And I say that with a great deal of, of sadness. I mean, this is, a, this is the movement that 
that, that, that shaped me and, 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 and made me who I am, and uh, a movement that uh, I, I still, it's part of my DNA. I, 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 I can't get away from it. I try various times, but I can't get away from it. But it's a movement that I think has lost its soul. So I think the, the biggest challenge facing evangelicalism is recovering its moral compass. Catholics always say, if we have you at six, we have you for life. And it sounds like <laughs> evangelicals are the same yeah. way, right? I, just to follow up on that real quick, uh, there, there's, uh, some of you may have heard me say this before. Um, an old Baptist said to me once, uh, you know, when you mix, I'll clean it up for a Gordon Conwell audience, right? But when you mix horse manure and vanilla ice cream, right, together, uh, the vanilla ice cream is ruined forever, but the horse manure is going to stay the same. You know, he says it. You know, and, and how you know how much this is an old Baptist kind of separation. I know Randy's written a lot of sort of the Baptists, right? How we need to be more Baptist, but yeah, this idea of separation of church and state—it's always going to hurt the church. Yeah. Are you going to use that in your sermon on Sunday? <laughs> you <have a> chapter. <laughs> Don't you have a chapter, Randy, on in one of your books yeah, on that? Where yeah. have all the Baptists gone? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, but you know, that's, that's an important point. I. I uh, <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I am a passionate <laughs> defender of the First Amendment. I, I was an expert witness in the Alabama Ten Commandments case. Uh, I believe passionately in, in, in the First Amendment, and I do so because of the integrity of the faith. Now, people talk about Roger Williams, who was the person who really started this conversation about the wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. And what people tend not to Mark, recognize. Mark the Wolf House, famous book about this. Right, the Garden, yeah, the the Garden in the Wilderness, right. What people tend to forget is that Puritans like Roger Williams were not members of the Sierra Club. That is to say, they don't hold our post thoreauian romance about wilderness. For them, the wilderness was a place of darkness where evil lurked. And so when Roger Williams is talking about separating the garden of the church from the wilderness of the world, what he's concerned about is maintaining the integrity of the faith from too close an association with the state. And I, we, we, we've somehow lost that part of his, his vision, but I think it's very important. No, I mean, a perfect example of this is actually what's happening right now. Like, I can't bring up the border again. You have, you have, you know, these, what, what are they? Thousands of kids who they can't find them. Where you know Trump didn't write down where they went, right after they were separated from their families. And and where are, I wrote about this on my blog today. Where are the great champions of family values on this question, right? Why aren't they speaking out? Well, to do so would mean to alienate the president, right? And 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 perhaps push them out of power. And that's that's what happens, right? When these things. Here's a high ball to center field for both of you. What's been the biggest gift that evangelicals have brought to politics in the past 30 years? <laughs> and what's been the most problematic inheritance of evangelicals involved in politics? So gift well, and problematic inheritance. I, mean, I, 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 I guess in, in terms of the gift, I would have to say uh, keeping attention focused on the abortion issue. I think that's... that's now, I, you know, again, I will add the caveat that that's not how the movement started. And I spent the afternoon with dropping names here, I'm sorry, but I had spent the afternoon with Frank Schaefer uh, talking about this and exactly how this came, to came about, and he, he's, he's very clear about this. Uh, but uh, what happened with the religious right is that the religious right did join forces with the Catholics to make what was once, or throughout the 1970s, a Catholic issue into an issue that evangelicals cared about. So I think, sure, that's, that's a it, it's, it's important to have that discussion. Now, I don't think the discussion's gone very far, to be honest, in terms of moving the, the needle on, on the debate, and I think the debate is framed all wrong, frankly, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, I think the bad part has been this kind of intractable uh, uh, marriage uh, between evangelicalism and, and the Republican Party, uh, as if to say that, uh, that one party, any party, can uh, be the party of God. and. Uh, I, I don't see it that way. <laughs> John? I would agree with Randy on the, sec on the second, what's, what's wrong? I mean, that's at the heart of it. You know, I mean, I, I spend time every day with young evangelical students, and they inspire me, frankly. Uh, their, their, their passion for justice, for 
solving the problems of the world, for engaging with um, you know, those in need, uh, going all over the world to, you know, I, I lo uh, Nick Kristoff, the New York Times columnist, hung around, uh, some of you might remember that op-ed, hung around with evangelicals, I think it was in Sudan or Africa, mm -hmm. and um, you know, just was blown away by their sense of service, their, all in the name of their faith. So, you know, we don't hear those stories, and it's partly because evangelicals have so tacked on to the, to the Republican Party. And it, evangelicalism has become a political term and identity today. We don't hear these stories of these kids each and every day, young people especially, but also old, you know, um, you know who, are, who are serving the Lord uh, in just incredible ways. And uh, the, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ um, animating them uh, in these ways, uh, you know, and, and as a product of that, someone who converted from Catholicism, one of, I'm one of those people who left, sorry. Um, no, you're, you know, you're, not a, you're not alone. You know, so. I had, a, I had a, 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 and again, some people say I'd still be Catholic if I had a good priest. That's what someone once told me. <laughs> so who knows? But, but, you know, as someone who, as someone who had a life-changing conversion experience as a 16-year-old, um, you know, that, that, that redirected the course of, of my life. And, and you know, that's something, talk about the DNA, right? I mean, that's something that still drives me to, uh, to defend the, so my wife always tells me, like, you're saying too much stuff negative about even, what's good about evangelicals? What are we doing good? What's doing, you know? And uh, you know, I, I always tell her, like, this is not the time for that. We need to, <laughs> deal. but I need to, I need to be more conscious about that. I always tell my students that um, all religion like politics is local. So for Catholics at Boston College is 70% Roman Catholic. I would say if your local parish works, the church is fine. Yeah. And if your local parish doesn't work, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who sits in the Vatican. This is a, the yeah. church is not working. Yeah. This is my Catholic friend, Paul Contino, who told me this. Yeah, he said, if you were, you know, if, you're, if you had a good parish priest, you'd still be Catholic today. Yeah, that's, right. that's right.